Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome to Dune class number five. Uh, as we have come to the end of book one, uh, well, in our reading assignments, we've come to the end of book one. We haven't quite come to the end of book one uh, in our discussion yet. Uh, but, of course, I've cunningly planned ahead for that. So, tonight, we are going to start off by finishing our close analysis of the end of book one of that final chapter in which Paul has his quite unusual psychological experience. And um, then we are uh, going to be moving on to uh, a couple questions. I, wanted, I was going to start with uh, Sarah Lagarde's request from last time um, to look at the, uh, uh, the, the works of Princess Irulan. So we're going to... Uh, um, we're 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 gonna we're gonna look at that, and uh, I, I hope Sarah, I hope that you and, uh, and and others will will help me with that. I think there are a bunch of observations and conclusions we can come to uh, about Princess Irulan so far. Uh, and uh, no dumb, uh, the one who points the way. This is this is not pointing elf, uh, of course. Though uh, now that you mention that, I will always be thinking of pointing elf <coughs> in the Hobbit films. Uh, as the little more deep from now on. Um, uh, by the way, Dom, congratulations. Uh, Dominic Nardi, our, our regular uh, uh, attendee uh, in this class and uh, the uh, one of our MythCard students uh, just recently won the award whose name I can never remember, but the uh, award for the best graduate student paper at MythCon this past year. So congratulations, Dom. Um, that was really cool. So anyway, um, we're gonna... Um, we're gonna we're, we're gonna get to Princess Irland, and then there are a few, a few other questions that I have from people that I wanna that I wanna get to. Yes, the Alexander Con Kondratayev uh, uh, Award. Thank you, Dom, for reminding me of the name. I always forget that. Um, okay, let's get back. Last time when we stopped, I won't say ended. Uh, when we stopped, um, you know, when I when I when I cut it off and said, now it is complete because it's ended here. Um, I, uh, uh, we were right at the point where he was screaming, no, 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 no. So let's, uh, let me just sort of remind us of where we were there. This is the last passage we had looked at. Um, and I'm going to reread it just to sort of recontextualize us in where we were. And now he saw that he had a wealth of data few such minds ever before had encompassed, but this made the empty place within him no easier to bear. He felt that something must shatter. It was as though a clockwork control for a bomb had been set to ticking within him. It went on about its business no matter what he wanted. It recorded minuscule shadings of difference around him, a slight change in moisture, a fractional fall in temperature, the progress of an insect across their still tent roof, the solemn approach of dawn in the star-lighted patch of sky he could see out the tent's transparent end. The emptiness was unbearable. Knowing how the clockwork had been set in motion made no difference. He could look to his own past and see the start of it, the training, the sharpening of talents, the refined pressures of sophisticated disciplines, even exposure to the O.C. Bible at a critical moment, and, lastly, the heavy intake of spice. And he could look ahead, the most terrifying direction, to see where it all pointed. I'm a monster, he thought, a freak. No, he said, and then no, no, no. Okay, so remember that this whole process began uh, with, uh, with Paul at the beginning of this when he seemed to go into Superman-tat mode. Remember how he was, uh, he was doing two things, right? He was doing like super Bene Gesserit observation mode, right? Like when the Thopter landed and he could, by the accumulation of minutiae, uh, he could, uh, uh, he, 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 so he made all these observations that even his mother missed um, and uh, was able to, to, to derive a conclusion, not just, you know, possibilities as uh, the, of which the Baron disapproves, but could know with a certainty. He could, he could, he could prove that it was Duncan Idaho uh, that was flying that thopter. Um, so we have him, again, the, like the super observation mode, super mentat mode. The change was, was swift and sudden, right? And he described it like it was something that was happening to him, not like something that he was doing exactly. Then we saw a little bit later on how he, things suddenly shifted and then the question, the, the issue of his prescience 
came in, um, and we and in particular, remember that was the uh, the his 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 prescient vision came upon him, but it was not. Um, he he didn't even have the the sort of the protection of dreams, right? Um, Patrick Summer says a new grid imposed itself on him. Yeah, yeah, or perhaps in some sense, like the almost infinite multiplication of grids. Um, I th one thing that I think is interesting, Patrick, and I'm not sure how far to push this. Um, it, this might not be. Uh, um, this might be nothing, but what I'm tempted to think, Patrick, that image of grids, right? It's very, it's very Cartesian, right? I mean, if you if you if you think about the grids as we've been as we've been discussing that metaphor all the way through, the grid is at least the grid most likely that we all pictured is a Cartesian grid. It's just a, a you know a square grid, a two-dimensional grid, um, and I'm tempted to put that image of the grid against Paul. In his in the in his prescient vision, when he sees himself at the center of a sphere with paths leading out in all directions, right? Um, like that shift exactly. Gerald Michael anticipated me. Paul got converted to polar coordinates. That's exactly exactly what I was thinking. Um, not literally, but yeah, it is like the shift from Cartesian to polar coordinates. Um, but not even thinking of it in in those sort of technical terms. Um, to because you know he's not been using heavily mathematical language like that, um, but certainly um, thinking about that in terms of dimensions, right? From a from a flat two dimensional view of things, to a, you know to a to a to a round spherical view of things. Um, uh, so he um, uh, again, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to put too much pressure on that because. You know, here I'm sort of drawing two metaphors that were used at different points, you know, at, at very separate points in the book, and it's not, um, um, it's not that I am, I get, it, it, I don't feel sufficient warrant from within the book to really, to to really make that connection really firmly, but it's kind of interesting, I think, um, and uh, and you know, in particular, Patrick, because I'm coming back to what you were saying here, um, what happens to him? is clearly more than just a new grid, right? Certainly in the sense in which we've been talking about grids. We've, we've looked at several different kinds of, of grids, those, those, those grids through which people see the world, by which people measure and understand the world, right? The Bene Gesserits think they, under, they, they perceive things and they think they understand how things work. Uh, Baron Harkonnen looks at things and thinks he understands how things work. Um, the Fremen look at things and think they understand how things work. And we, we have seen these two grids come into conflict in, for instance, that conversation between Shadat Mapes and Jessica, right? Um, where we saw the Bene Gesserit, um, you know, the Bene Gesserit, Missionara, Protectiva grid, right? Um, and which she herself, Jessica herself, called a sham, right? As she was playing it out. But then we saw Mapes's grid, um, which we were invited from the beginning of that conversation to see, to see, you know, Mapes's commentary from the, you know, through Jessica's grid, right? Um, you know that Jessica was playing this up, and Mapes was responding exactly as she was supposed to respond. You know, to the 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 you know the primitive sucker was falling for the lines just like she was supposed to. It's exactly what the missionary protectiva was all about. Except maybe there's something in it, right? Um, and then we saw again the same thing when we were looking at the passages about the fulfilled prophecies from Kinds uh, later on, and the question keeps. Then coming up, wait a second. Whose grid is right? Um, are, are you know? It, it's not necessarily just that the Bene Gesserit are all knowing and and the others are ignorant. Um, remember also um, the other metaphor that we were looking at. The metaphor um, last time within this scene, right? The metaphor Paul perceiving time uh, as like a handkerchief, right, blowing in the wind. Again a flat plane there, right, but now wrinkled, 
and moving so that you've got things being, you know, different parts of it being brought together into contact um, and him not being able just to see everything in front of him. And that was a, a metaphor for his perception of the future, right? His perception of time. Um, that it's not just, you know, he can see the future, but it's not just that he can perceive what is coming ahead in a linear system, right? Um, you know, that he is there up above, you know, the 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 the, the one-dimensional span of time, right? One direction into the past and the other direction into the future. And you can just kind of peek down the line and be like, oh, yeah, I see what's going to happen. Then. No, it's not like that, right? First of all, it describes it as planar, not as a single line from past to future. But then secondly, again, it's disruptive, right? Um, and uh, it's more complicated. It's in motion. Um, okay, okay. So, um, but anyway, that, that was a digression, which is your fault, Patrick. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, no, I was. I'm, I'm glad to review some of that stuff. Um, and I had had kind of the the. <laughs> I had the polar coordinates thing in my mind, Gerald, uh, from last time. I didn't get to talk about it, so glad enough to do that. Uh, but anyhow, uh, okay, so we were so we were saying where where Paul was and where he was going. So remember, at that point, when his consciousness, his, his awareness, um, you know, went up to this, you know, was elevated to this other higher level, and now he's seeing all these things that's described as this flood of data, right? He is perceiving, he is perceiving everything about everybody, all of this stuff that he's getting, he, and he's able to see and draw conclusions, he's able to see things really clearly from his earlier in the conversation um, perception of how, you know, how obvious it becomes to him, for instance, that the Fremen are paying the guild to keep the, the space above uh, Arrakis satellite free, um, you know, which, you know, his, his mom doesn't know and can't figure out. Um, we see him gaining insights which seem to be not just based on analysis, right? Not just based on logical analysis of data. His conclusion about the Fremen and the Spacing Guild is based upon data um, that he has. It's a conclusion that he draws. But then there are other things like the Spacing Guild, right? He, he talks about the Guild, and what he says about the Guild shows that he knows more about the Guild than we do, right? Um, but yet he doesn't really, he doesn't have any means of knowing that exactly. That's not just something that it, he's put together in the same way that he draws the other conclusion. Um, so we see him, um, uh, but we see him connected. Philip uh, Lord is very right to point out that we see him become super mentat, super Bene Gesserit, and possibly super guildsman. Yeah, he, he, he suggests... When he does talk about the guildsmen, as Philip reminds us, what he says is uh, he's sort of declaring a likeness between himself and them, right? That could be, I could fit in there, right? I might be accepted by the guild. Um, that there is something in what is going on with him which is in some way like um, the, uh, what the guildsmen do in some sense. Um, so yeah, yeah, um, Philip. I do think that that's that that's important. We see him as kind of the culmination um, of all of these things, as sort of uh, you know, like you know, sort of the capstone on all of these things. But now here, um, again, the things I would draw attention to. This is the last passage that we were looking at. What we have him struggling with, and remember, of course, we have his dispassion, right? But it's not just mentat dispassion, right? It's not just I am. Uh, you know, not going to have my efficiency impaired by my emotions um, kind of thing that we see Mentats trying and failing to do. Uh, I think it was, uh, wasn't it uh, uh, Chris Swank, I think, uh, who couldn't be here tonight, um, who's pointing out what a, what, a, what a poor job, what a poor record Mentats in this book have about uh, uh, achieving the kind of emotional distance which theoretically they're supposed to attain. Um, but anyhow, um, but as many of you are pointing out, it's not that he simply was incapable 
of experiencing any emotion, he quickly became angry and, and, and is, is clearly experiencing extremely powerful emotions here. The emotion in particular that he is walled off from or that he feels to be walled off from himself is grief, right? Mourning for his dad. He, 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 he knows he should mourn, but he, uh, he can't mourn him, and this really bothers him. Um, so I think it's important to remember the personal element there, right? That is to say, again, it's not just a question of him being cut off from emotion. It's a question of him being cut off from that experience of mourning, mourning which is derived from um, from personal connection, right? The personal connection between him and his dad. Um, you know, that's that's where mourning comes from, right? When that when that bond is broken, um, and that kind of personal link is the thing which he sort of he, he is aware of the fact that it existed but he can't um, he can't feel it he can't access it okay um, notice here in this last passage that we see him um, you know I was emphasizing how he first of all you know, we have this wealth of data um, that uh, you know had, had a few such minds and uh, several people last time were commenting on that phrase, few such minds, like how many such minds as this have there been? Um, but anyway, had, had, had ever before had encompassed. Um, notice the emphasis on two things. One is again this sort of this sense of something happening to him. Um, I talked about the progression of the it's in those three sentences which I love. It was as though it went on, it recorded. Um, the it getting more and more personal, more and more concrete, this thing that's doing stuff. He's not recording minuscule shadings of difference around him. Um, he's not paying attention to that stuff, but it, it's, and it's not it just, it happened, or it, but that thing, whatever it is, that has awakened within him is doing the recording, right? And he, his own consciousness, his own, his own, you know, ego, his own sense of himself is distant from that. The other thing that we have emphasized here in this paragraph and in the next paragraph is that empty space, the emptiness, right? He feels this unbearable emptiness, and there's a paradox there, of course, right? He's just been, we've just been describing how he's crammed absolutely full, right? He's, um, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's like taken in the life experiences of, of, you know, thousands and millions of people, um, he's he's full, but that's not his sense of it, right? He feels empty, and he feels that there's this empty place within him. Um, now, what is that empty place? How do we understand that? Um, I'm forgetting now. Ah, oh, shoot. Somebody, if you're here, tell me. I always hate it when I can't correctly attribute a comment. Somebody sent me an email, and I'm totally blanking on who it was, um, can, uh, pointing to the to the, the the sort of the suggestive connection of that final image uh, that Duke Leto has of himself right before that last sentence about the the day the flesh makes and the flesh the day makes. Um, right before that, when he views himself as a bin that's being filled up. Right, um, thinking of the connection between that, uh, Leto's image of himself as a bin sucking things into itself, and how Paul describes his experience here, um, um, and I do think that that's a really interesting connection. But yet again, he doesn't feel like an overstuffed bin; he feels like an empty space, right? Um, and knowing. You know, understanding what's going on or understanding how this came to be doesn't help, right? He does understand how it came to be. He looks into his own past and he sees all of these factors that came together to bring him to this moment that sort of led this to happen. Um, but then he looks ahead, which is the terrifying direction, and he says, I'm a monster, a freak. Now, he's called himself a freak earlier on in the conversation, I was suggesting at the very end of class last time that it seems to me that he means something different when he says that he is a freak now than before. Before he was just sort of just saying, I'm not, I don't fit the categories that you like, you know, um, 
you know, she said, you, you know, you're not a mentat yet. He's like, no, I'm not a mentat. I'm a freak, right? Um, that is to say, you, you're not going to be able to fit me into into your categories because I'm something weird already. The calling himself freak is already putting a putting a bit of a negative spin, right, uh, on on how he's conceiving of himself and his own sense of his being different from established categories. Here, he's linking it directly with monster, which is a little bit different, I think. Um, and in particular, it's in the context of him looking ahead into the future to see where all of the, where the trajectory of his life is pointing um, and how terrifying it is to look in that direction. And then we have him crying, no, 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 no. Um, and so, that in mind, let's carry on. Did you know what you were, what, what you were doing when you trained me, he asked. There's no more childhood in his voice, she thought. Remember earlier on when he said, when Paul thought, why is she so slow, right? Now we can see that, right? We've just been shown all of this stuff going on inside Paul's mind, and we see her saying there's no more childhood in his voice. Well, no, yes, it's true. He's kind of grown up here. Um, he certainly has lost the innocence of childhood, but... Uh, Jessica, there's a little more going on here than that, right? Yes, that has happened. Um, even in, in thinking that, we can see that she's thinking of this in terms of this is like, you know, some kind of reaction, some kind of emotional reaction or something that he's having in response to his father's death or, you know, Dewey's betrayal or, um, you know, any of these other things. Um, and we see, again, she is just does not understand what's going on. And she said... I hope the thing any parent hopes, that you'd be superior, different. Different? She heard the bitterness in his tone, said, Paul, I, you didn't want a son, he said. You wanted a Kwisatz Haderach. You wanted a male Bene Gesserit. She recoiled from his bitterness. But Paul, did you ever consult my father in this? She spoke gently out of the freshness of her grief. Whatever you are, Paul, the heredity, the heredity is as much your father as me. That's an interesting kind of response, isn't it? Like, uh, it's like 50% your dad's fault if you're the Kwisatz Haderach. Um, this does not answer his question, right? You wanted a Kwisatz Haderach. Did you ever consult my father in this? Notice what he is... Um, Notice what he is accusing her of, right? And this comes in very interestingly because, again, this is one of the places where we started in this book, right? In the conversations between Jessica and the Reverend Mother back on Caledon, that Jessica had a son when she was supposed to have had a daughter. She was supposed to have had a daughter because the, Jenny, the Bene Gesserit had this plan, their genetic plan, um, and, uh, and a, an Atreides daughter was what was supposed to come so they could continue mixing it with other, with other bloodlines. Again, it's relatively transparent based on what the Reverend Mother says, that they were planning to marry the Atreides daughter off to Phaedra Alpha Harkonnen um, to heal the breach, as she says, but it's not about healing. It's not it's not simply about politics. Um, it's about trying to combine those two bloodlines. But of course, they've already been combined in Paul, as we discover here in this chapter that Jessica is the Baron's daughter. Um, however, remember again, the tension back in that first chapter was between the Bene Gesserit plan, the, 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 the standing orders that Jessica had with regard to her marriage to the Duke, and her own choice to bring forth a son. And at that point already, there were two reasons given for why she had a son. A primary one and sort of the secondary one. The primary one was love of her husband, right? Because it meant so much to him to have a son. Um, and that, and we, 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 we could see the story presented it to us at the time as you know, sort of Jessica having chosen between her loyalty to the Bene Gesserits and her uh, her love of the Duke, right? And when the two of them were in conflict, she chose her love for her husband instead of her loyalty to the Bene Gesserits. Um, but we also knew, even back then, that she harbored this hope 
that he would be the Cuisance Haderach, right? She, um, you know, she, uh, the Reverend Mother accused her of thinking she could, uh, she could bring forth the Cuisance Haderach. Paul lands on that very sharply, and notice how he twists this around. It's not just that he says, actually, your motivations were opposite, right? You wanted the Cuisance Haderach, first of all, you know, it seems, he doesn't say, you know, you saying that you just wanted to bring forth a son to please Duke Leto um, is a smokescreen, right? Or a rationalization. Maybe she's fooling herself, right? Paul is saying this was your real motivation. And notice how he sort of twists this around and stabs her with it. Did you ever consult my father in this? Consult his father? in bearing him a son, that thing she did for love of him in defiance of the Bene Gesserits. But, sort of in defiance of the Bene Gesserits, also in compliance with the Bene Gesserits, also as a sort of embodiment of the central hope and plan of the Bene Gesserits. The Bene Gesserits wanted her to bring forth a girl so that they could continue their genetic plan, which is oriented towards having the Cuisance Haderach, right? Producing the Cuisance Haderach. Um, so, you know, she's like disobeying in the in the small scale, but obeying in the big scale. Or rather, she shares that vision um, of, uh, of the Bene Gesserits. And that is what he calls her on here, saying you were basically still acting as a Bene Gesserit. Again, not not that he's quite, he's, he's, he's explicitly saying she's gone, you know, that, uh, about that, that he's challenging that distinction of loyalties, um, that division of loyalties that I was talking about before. But again, essentially saying you are to your core one of them, right? Um, you didn't really betray your Bene Gesserit roots. You demonstrated your Bene Gesserit roots by conceiving me, a son, instead of the daughter you were supposed to have. Um, and did my father realize that that's what you were doing? He thought you were bringing him forth a ducal heir, right? Um, did he realize that you were trying to make the Quisats Hadarach? Um, to which he tries to turn it back, you know, your heredity comes as much from him as from me. Uh, yeah, um, the, her the heredity issue, <clears throat> not helping the Bene Gesserit argument, right? Yeah, yeah, of course it is, right? Um, yeah, good. Um, okay, more. But not the training, he said. Not the things that awakened the sleeper. The sleeper? It's here. He put a hand to his head and then to his breast. In me. It goes on and on and on and on and... Awakened the sleeper. This is not the first time that Paul refers, you know, I've been talking about how we've seen some evidence, it's been relatively subtle, right? It doesn't really smack you in the face, the way that it kind of talk, that, that the narrator has been speaking as if this thing within Paul is separate from him, um, uh, that, um, that uh, you know, that, that, that this is in some sense outside of his own consciousness, almost like an intrusion upon him, right? This is something that has come upon him or happened to him, not happened to him, come upon him, right? It's a thing, right? It's not a state of mind. Um, it's not a, a consequence. It's not an event. It's a creature, Right, it's a, it's, it is itself a kind of consciousness, um, and he characterizes it here. Right, it's a sleeper. He anthropomorphizes it, um, and uh, K. That's a wonderful observation. K. Is interested in the ellipses here. Um, uh, K. Asks, was he searching for another word before awakened? Not the things that awakened the sleeper, um, and K. I find that second ellipsis even more fascinating, right? You'd think that the sleeper would suggest itself once you've committed yourself to awakened, right? But I couldn't prove this, Kay, but here would be my theory. My reading of those two ellipses is that the first time he's searching for the right word, right? Or maybe, Kay, there's another word that he wants to say but doesn't chooses not to say but anyway I think he's I think it's I think it's uh, him 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 thinking about the word the usage that first time the second time 
I think it's not that because again you don't have to search far, search very far for sleeper once you've gotten to a weekend right um, but I there I see simply as reluctance right he doesn't want to name it he doesn't want to in this moment he is anthropomorphizing it he's sort of recognizing its existence uh, sort of officially right um, Philip Menzies is saying the monster right it could be awakened the monster uh, maybe maybe um, yeah. Oh, Jess, uh, Jessa, uh, Jessa Bright says, the use of the term sleeper reminds me of the earlier passage when Jessica watched Paul pretend to be asleep. It highlights the change in their relationship and positive and position relative to each other. Uh, that's, that's a great observation, Jessa. And you know, we're talking about that passage at the time. That was when, when Jessica and Yui were looking in on him, right? And... Um, the, the sort of the irony of that passage when, you know, she is looking at Paul and saying, oh, what sweet abandon in the sleep of a child. Um, and then we learn that Paul is faking the whole time, right? So she's commenting on how, how deeply and peacefully he's sleeping. Um, and in fact, he's faking it. Uh, he's not asleep at all. Um, and there, so we, we can see there also, Jessica, can't we, like a, a foreshadowing of her not seeing what's really going on, right? Her not understanding the uh, the you know what's 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 sort of truly in his mind um, but uh, but but just I do like that your your emphasis about the change in their relationship um, that's again you know because that was that was one of the moments that was most maternal right most mother child moments between Paul and Jessica um, so, and that dynamic certainly has, I won't say reversed, because it's not like he's being the mom here, but, uh, but certainly altered. There's no more childhood in his voice is, as we said, a pretty big understatement. Um, good. Nancy Fosberg points out, it also harken, harkens back to how he used to have these visions when asleep, but has lost that protection. Yeah, he doesn't even have the protection of dreams uh, anymore, right, of dreaming. Um, it's now breaking in upon his waking thought. Um, there's that that distinction between um, between his own awareness and his prescient awareness, um, which used to be, you know, dreams used to be that frontier, right? Um, the difference between sleeping and waking. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Good. Kay is continuing to think about that first ellipsis. More Kay. I want to hear it. Okay. Awaken seems to be a diminutive choice. Like his first impulse was to something darker and more dangerous. He's afraid to say it all out loud and make it real, perhaps. Kay, that's exactly what I was thinking when he when I was talking about his reluctance to say the sleeper. Um, that, that, that naming it and making it real thing. Um, to actually utter the fact that there's, like, a thing. Right. Not just that I think differently now or I feel differently now but that there's a thing that has awakened um, but um, but yeah yeah uh, I'm willing to believe that awakened is as you suggest Kay, a diminutive choice there um, okay um, yeah yeah good um, and Kay follows that up by saying it's interesting that awakening a sleeper means it was always there. It's not something that Jessica did to him with the training. Right, exactly. Um, did you know what you were well, what you were doing when you trained me? Um, one wonders if she is hearing that as him saying, "Look what you did to me. You made me like this." Right. But it's pretty clear that that's not what he's thinking. Um, even again, if we go back um, to where he talked about the training um, right before, right? He could look to his own past and see the start of it, whatever it is. Um, the setting in motion of the clockwork, right? The time that, you know, the ticking down of the time bomb was set in motion by the training, the sharpening of talents. But, Kay, just as waking the sleeper implies that the thing was already there, right? Uh, to say that the ticking of the clockwork com control for a bomb was started here, well, the bomb's already there, right? Um, you can start the uh, ticking all you want. <clears throat> uh, it's not gonna, it's not going to matter if there's no bomb. Um, so I, I think we can see a similar a similar thing there. 
Okay. Um, all right. So he says that the thing, the sleeper, is in him. Um, all right. Skipping out a little bit. So here we live out our lives, she thought, on this hell planet. The place is prepared for us if we can evade the Harkonnens, and there's no doubt of my course, a broodmare preserving an important bloodline for the Bene Gesserit plan. Uh, notice how she's characterizing that, right? A broodmare preserving an important bloodline for the Bene Gesserit plan. Um, she speaks with some scorn. It's not... It is not unlike the tone she uses when she talks about the, the sham, right? Keeping up the sham when she's um, playing up the whole Missionaria Protectiva thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, keep on. Uh, uh, let's keep going now. I must tell you about my waking dream, Paul said. Now there was fury in his voice. To be sure you accept what I say, I'll tell you first. I know you'll bear a daughter, my sister, here on Arrakis. Jessica placed her hands against the tent floor, pressed back against the curving fabric wall to still a pang of fear. She knew her pregnancy could not show yet. Only her own Bene Gesserit training had allowed her to read the first faint signals of her body, to, to know of the embryo, only a few weeks old. Only to serve, Jessica whispered, clinging to the Bene Gesserit motto. We exist only to serve. So much for the Bene Gesserit plan, right? That's where she takes refuge, when she's terrified, right? We'll find a home among the Fremen, Paul said, where your missionaria protectiva has bought us a bolt hole. They've prepared a way for us in the desert, Jessica told herself. But how can he know of the missionaria protectiva? She found it increasingly difficult to subdue her terror at the overpowering strangeness in Paul. Um, okay, Sean is uh, Sean Hyde is interested in the emphasis. I know you'll bear a daughter, my sister, here on Arrakis. Um, uh, the uh, the emphasis Sean finds interesting. Like, would a daughter be anything but his sister? Um, like, why is it? Is that a clarification? Um, uh, is that uh, you know you know exactly what uh, you know that. This, you know, Sean, what I take from that is sort of the impersonality of that, right? It's almost like the personal connection to himself. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. You're my mother. And uh, th that, uh, that girl child, which shall be born of you, uh, would be my sister, right? You know, again, th there's, there's, there's that kind of the sort of his own depersonalization, um, it seems, yeah. Um, K. K. Ben Abraham is on fire tonight. Uh, K. is saying, bolt holes and brood mares, the human animal line we're skirting again. I had totally not been thinking of that, K., but isn't that interesting? All of this animal imagery that we're getting to describe, um, to, to, to describe them and notice in both cases, extra conspicuously, K., it's Bene Gesserit stuff, right? She is a brood mare preserving the bloodline for the Bene Gesserit plan, pointing to that paradox that, that we saw way back in class one, right? About, you know, how they're all obsessed about humans and uh, preserving the bloodlines of, of, of humans uh, as opposed to animals, and yet in doing so, they're treating the humans like animals, like brood mares, right? Um, uh, good, and now and now the missionaria protectiva preparing, preparing a bolt hole. Um, like rabbits, right? Uh-oh, wait a second. Rabbits bolting into holes? That's not good. Um, it, well, unless there are bees around, I guess it's fine. Um, <laughs> because we know what happens when the bees come after the rabbits and they bolt into their holes. Um, uh, okay, good, good. Um, Yeah, yeah. G Gerald, I agree that the clarification, my sister, probably, you know, it, it does clarify that the daughter already exists and will not, you know, it's not like a product of a second marriage or anything. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, Nancy and Kay were both ahead of me on the uh, on remembering the bees. Good, good. Um, K 
Carolyn Morehouse suggests maybe the sister, maybe the my sister reference uh, refers to her being a true sister, having similar powers to himself. Um, interesting, possibly, possibly. Um, Sharon Powell uh, makes a makes an important distinction, I think, um, which I'm prepared to accept, Sharon. Sharon says, in the first paragraph, I don't see scorn in Jessica's voice, but rather bitterness, that she is not a human with her own free will to the Bene Gesserits, but just a broodmare. Yes, yes, I agree, I agree. Um, bitterness, I think, is a good word there. This is, that's, um, you know, we were just, we were just getting bitterness earlier on in, in, in this passage, right? Um, um, he was speaking with great bitterness, and we see her bitterness directed towards the Bene Gesserits, but again, at the same time, we see um, uh, her clinging to the Bene Gesserit motto, right? We exist only to serve. Um, and it's, that seems, of all things, ironic, doesn't it? I mean, we kind of know by this time that the Bene Gesserit motto is a sham, right? It's a different kind of sham. It's not exactly, you know, the Missionaria Protectiva game, but it's it's a different one, right? It's a false... They're not existing only to serve, or rather, that's true if you define serve in a very particular way, which most people wouldn't uh, use, right? They're not, you know... Uh, if you say that to try to control and mastermind everything from behind the scenes is service to humanity, right? Um, okay. Um, but, uh, but again, you know, so that, that, that motto <clears throat> is, um, if, you know, Sharon, thinking of what you were just saying about the bitterness um, in her voice earlier on, uh, surely, surely the motto of the Bene Gesserit should come, you know, should, uh, um, taste even more bitter in her mouth, right? Thinking, you know, we exist only to serve, thinking of her relationship to the Bene Gesserit, the, whole, the business with her choosing to have a son and all these things, right? And yet that's what she clings to when she is scared. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, good. So, okay. Um, why is she so scared? Why is she so scared? How do we interpret her terror here? What has just happened? And I, I, I mean this question in a relatively simple way. Um, remember, we've seen her perception, again, this is one of the consequences of the way the narrative point of view works in this story, by bringing us, by giving us, you know, sort of metaphor after metaphor to try to understand what's going on in Paul's mind here. Um, and then occasionally flipping back to Jessica, we, we have gotten a sense, not, not just Paul, but our own perception of how far Jessica is lagging behind Paul has become more and more acute, right? Um, what, just, what just happened? Uh, Patrick says, uh, Patrick Summer says, Paul from her comprehension, um, very few, if any, are that way to a Bene Gesserit. Yes. Though I, but I, I think there's an important distinction, though. Uh, that's certainly true, and she's had some kind of... But she seems to have been resisting that, right, um, to this point in the conversation. Um, she is... Uh, um, we saw him again with, like, the Fremen and the weather satellite conclusion that he drew, right? We saw his mind going quicker, than hers, putting together things that she didn't notice, coming to conclusions that she failed to come to, um, and doing it easily and certainly when she, ha you know, so she has no clue and he has already proven it, right, not just suspected it, but proven it um, based on the information which she also had or could have had had she been noticing it, right? There we see him going beyond her, but she wasn't terrified then. And I would say something genuinely different has happened here. Um, to be sure you accept what I say, I'll tell you first. I know you'll bear a daughter, my sister, here on Arrakis. Why is that terrifying? Why is that terrifying? She's terrified that Paul knows that she's pregnant, yes? Yes. Why is that so terrifying? What's scary about that? 
I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's not just that he has... What we saw at the very beginning, right? Yeah, at, at, at the very start of this passage, when he was merely in Superman Tat slash Superman and Jesuit mode, right, was his faculties operating at a much higher level than everybody else's, but they were still the same faculties, right? Um, he observed more, but, but, but he, was, he was observing in a way which was like the Bene Gesserit way. He was just doing it way, way better than she, right? He was putting things together like a mentat. Um, yeah, he was doing it more quickly. Even I mean, how far was Thufar Hawat from figuring out the business with the satellites, right? He had no idea. Right, so here, so he's he's gone way above his mother in Bene Gesserit observation. He's gone way above Thufar Hawat in in his mentat abilities, but it's all still comprehensible. Right, we're just talking about. It's one thing to say his capacity for doing this thing with which we're familiar is a hundred times higher than anybody else's. Right, that's impressive. Maybe a little bit intimidating, but still normal. In a, in a, in not in a quantitative sense, right? Uh, in a, in a quantitative sense of norm, but in a qualitative sense, this is different. Um, Alyssa House Thomas says, "Now they're in the realm of prophecy." Yeah, he's not just saying, "I can figure stuff out that you can't figure out." Now he's saying, "I am telling you what's happening in the future." Right. Um, again, like that shift which we saw earlier on. Remember, right? We, you know, it was we went from Superman tat to now we're in the in the prescient awareness. Now we're looking off into the future. Right now, he's perceiving himself at the center of all these paths radiating outwards. It's different, um, and there is something here that is like what the Reverend Mother said about the Cuisance Haderach. Erica Henson points out he's observing a female avenue. This is evidence that he's the Cuisance Haderach. Um, it is like that, right? How does he know, how could he know that she is pregnant when she knows it to be impossible for anyone other than herself to have figured this, to have figured this out? Um, but now notice, he then immediately ups it from there. We'll find a home among the Fremen, he says, casually predicting the future with extreme confidence, where your missionaria protectiva has bought us a bolt hall. In saying that, he is proving not just the, the you know, he's not only backing up the prediction that he's making, right? He's not guessing. How can you know he's not guessing? Because look at what else he knows, right? How can he know of the missionaria protectiva? She has never told him. This isn't something you could just figure out. I mean, maybe, I guess, but think of what would be required for him just to deduce the existence of the Missionaria Protectiva. He would not only have to, you know, have observed the patterns in all of the, you know, the Messiah stuff that was going on among the Fremen and his mother's relationship with it and made lots of really, really subtle observations and everything and deduced this must be a Bene Gesserit thing and also deduced what the Bene Gesserits would name such a thing, right? But that certainly doesn't seem to be how she's taking it, right? It's not that he's deduced it. Again, it's not like the weather satellites. He knows stuff that he's never been taught. He has access to information that no human being in his position and with his scope of knowledge should be able to know. No one ever told him about the Missionaria Protectiva. It's a secret. And she is the only Bene Gesserit he, apart from the Reverend Mother briefly, is the only Bene Gesserit he has ever known, right? She knows he has never been told about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, she found it increasingly difficult to subdue her terror at the overpowering strangeness in Paul. It's like some sleeper just awoke. CK, I was trying to do your ellipses there. 
I did it, you know, the words backwards, but it's okay. Um, yeah, good. Sharon points out she's terrified because Paul is now unpredictable to her. Yeah, Paul does not fit into her categories. Again, maybe before she's like, you're not a mentat yet, right? You're acting like a mentat, but you're... But yet, yeah, now she... Um, she... Um, she can't do it. Now, Erica is pointing out that she thinks that he could have deduced her pregnancy. I also, Erica, I'm willing to believe that. Um, you know, her saying he could never possibly have perceived the signs. Well, yeah, but we've seen the signs that he can perceive that she doesn't, right? So just because she doesn't believe it's possible doesn't mean that he couldn't do it. Um, um, I agree. I agree. Um, but... Um, But I guess I'd say sort of two things there. One, it's clear that her reaction, her terror, demonstrates, I think, that she believes that he has just gotten this information, that he has somehow psychically accessed information that he doesn't, and he's suggesting where he's gotten it, right? He can see the future. And she already knows, because she knows about his dreams, Right, that he's ha he has significant dreams, and that he dreams of things which are to come. She knows he dreams of the future. She knows that that's significant because it's one of the reasons she asked the Reverend Mother to come so he could tell her about his dreams. Um, and now he's having waking dreams, and he's doing this all in the context of talking about the future very casually, right? You know, very flatly. Uh, um, uh, you know, in uh, in in the uh, in the indicative mood. So, um, but he does, you know, uh, good, Tom has makes an excellent point. Um, but he couldn't have deduced daughter. Probably not. Probably, I mean, maybe there are subtle signs, uh, you know, that he now can perceive that I can't possibly imagine. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. I agree. Um, excellent. Yeah, Sharon was just pointing that out, too. He predicts that she will bear a daughter, predicting the future, that her pregnancy will not fail, that she'll actually give birth, that it'll be a girl. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Certainly in context, he is claiming to be able to, to see the future. And he's remember, he cites that as evidence here that he can. Like, so that you know that I'm not just making stuff up here. I'll, 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 I'll give you a prediction that... Uh, you know, that I know will... So again, notice how it's not just that he knows that she's pregnant, but he knows that his knowledge of her pregnancy will be accepted by her, will be received by her as proof of the accuracy of his foreknowledge. He knows he is going to terrify her by saying this. Um, okay, overpowering strangeness. The things that can happen here, I cannot begin to tell you, he said. I cannot even begin to tell myself, although I've seen them. The sense of this sense of the future, I seem to have no control over it. The thing just happens. The immediate future, say a year, I can see some of that. A road as broad as our central avenue on Caledon. Some places I don't see, shadowed places, as though it went behind a hill. And again he thought of the surface of a blowing handkerchief of a blowing kerchief. And there are branchings. He fell silent as memory of that seeing filled him. No prescient dream, no experience of his life had quite prepared him for the totality with which the veils had been ripped away to reveal naked time. Recalling the experience, he recognized his own terrible purpose, the pressure of his life spreading outward like an expanding bubble, time retreating before it. Okay, okay. Um, yes, as Kay points out, more ellipses, right? Um, do you want to do, 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 do some more ellipsis interpretation, Kay? That was fun. Let's do it again. Okay. Some places I don't see. Shadowed places, as though it went behind a hill. Okay, so the gap between shadowed places, between places and as, is clearly him grasping for simile, right? 
what do you mean by shadowed places? That's that's an ambiguous statement, right? Shadowed in the sense of dark, in the sense of evil, or what? No, he says shadowed in the sense of like too dark to see. You know, I can't I can't see it like it's behind a hill, right? It's obstructed, shadowed in that sense, like something is in the way of the light and the shadow behind it. Okay, okay. Um, some places I don't see. The pause between see and shadowed would seem to suggest um, that he is. He's a. Gay. I would. I, I think I'd, I'd see him doing the same thing there. Um, places I don't see. In what sense don't you see them? Shadowed places. To see a shadowed place is different from a thing just being invisible to you, right? Um, and then he he clarifies more what he means by that. And there are branchings. That final ellipsis, after branchings, K, is I think my favorite one in this passage. Um, there are branchings. I'm not going to tell you about the branchings, right? Why aren't you going to tell us about the branchings, Paul? Because it's too complicated for us to understand? Yeah, probably. Or because the branchings are too scary to think about? Or because they're too monstrous and freakish to think about? Um, why? Why, Paul? Um, he fell silent as that memory of seeing filled him. Nothing had prepared him for this totality. Um, Patrick, I'm thinking back to our earlier conversations about grids, right? Um, the veil has been ripped away, right? That's why I'm thinking not of this being... It seems to me that what we're being invited to perceive here Think back to the conversation between Paul and the Reverend Mother at the beginning. Um, that moment when she is describing things and, and describe about how you know about, about the the truth drug and um, and she's not telling the truth, but she's not lying, right? She's mistaken. The Bene Gesserits are wrong about how things work, right? And Paul can perceive that. Um, we said even at the time that his that sense that instinct for right, for rightness you know that instinct for truth that he has um, is um, uh, is uh, uh, it suggests that he has access not just to a different grid but to like the grid right that he can see um, see past the grids of others um, he can detect when the grid through which someone is measuring and comprehending and mapping the world is false to the world, which suggests that he has some kind of direct access to the real world, um, which the people who are using their own grids only have a partial access to. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that, I'm, I, that's, that's what I keep coming back to here with... Uh, the you know the ripping away of veils and the revelation of naked time uh, it wasn't about time in the beginning um, you know back in those early chapters um, so that's an interesting thing here but but other than that it seems to be kind of familiar um, Sharon Powell is correcting me um, or rather she is rather pointing to the significance of the slip that I have made more than once in calling the kerchief a handkerchief um, uh, Sharon is saying that uh, she thinks the kerchief is probably larger than a handkerchief, more like a headscarf. Yes, I agree. Uh, it is more like a headscarf, which is a more Fremen thing to have anyway uh, than, a, than a pocket handkerchief. Um, uh, of course, I'm sure most of you know why I'm thinking of pocket handkerchiefs uh, and why the word handkerchief flows so readily from my lips when I'm talking about this. Um, but of course, this is uh, not a Hobbit thing, but a Fremen thing, so uh, I should mind myself. Um, because Sharon, I think that you're right. It probably is headscarf, and so yeah, we should be thinking, um, we should be thinking of of, uh, of 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 the Fremen rather than of uh, hobbits <laughs> uh, or even Elrond's red silk handkerchief. Um, okay, all right. Kay wants to think about the italics now. All right, um, the words that are italicized. This sense of the future, a road, the memory of that seeing. So we've got these three italicized words in this in this uh, passage. Um, 
And uh, they do make for an interesting kind of pattern, don't they, Kay? Um, this sense of the future. Sense is a vague word, right? Perceiving the future somehow. The immediate future is like a road, right? It can be sensed very easily, right? Very readily. It's very clear. Um, but then the memory of that seeing. Um, and I love the word seeing there. Um, it's not he fell silent as a memory as the as memory of that sight filled him right it's not he's not remembering what he saw he is remembering the action of seeing right but he's remembering the action of seeing in the past tense he's not he is not now seeing um, he is he is it's the seeing that filled him past tense um, the veils the the totality with, it, with which the veils had been ripped away. It happened. It's not happening now. It happened at that one point, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Nancy, I agree with you, uh, Nancy, that none of the three of them are literal. Absolutely, I agree. Um, but the metaphorical sense of them seems to me to form a kind of, a kind of, uh, well, not progression, progression exactly. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, 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 good, and Kay was just pointing that out, too. Uh, they're all metaphorical. Um, yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, okay. Um, we can't skip over the reference to his terrible purpose, which we were talking about before. Remember, when, when, when did the terrible purpose come? That was awakened, too, wasn't it? Do you remember the circumstances of that? you remember when we saw that and what happened and how it was described? It's an important phrase repeated very often in the book. Terrible purpose when we talked about it back in class one. Yes, good, good. Uh, um, <laughs> Nobody answered for like more than a minute, and now I got like five at once. Yes, Philip, Kay, uh, uh, James, Tom, and Jessa, um, the Reverend Mother, and the Gom Jabbar, um, and both James and Jessa are remembering the word there, infected. He was infected with terrible purpose. It was like he had caught terrible purpose from the Gom Jabbar. Um, in retrospect, from this point of view, kind of sounds like the Gom Jabbar kind of woke the sleeper, doesn't it? Um, that that terrible purpose stirred within him, and now what's happening? He is recognizing. Oh, good. Brian was recalling the phrase too. Brian Yoder. Um, he recognized his own terrible purpose, um, recalling the experience the experience of having the veils ripped away to reveal naked time, presumably, what he was just talking about, he recognized his own terrible purpose, the pressure of his life spreading outward like an expanding bubble, time retreating before it. Okay, what do you do with those ellipses? Any thoughts? But anyway, um, recalling the experience, he recognized his own terrible purpose. That is, he recognized this is, like, now he gets it. It's like, oh, the terrible purpose. Yeah, I see, that's the terrible purpose, right? Having those veils ripped away, that's what the terrible purpose was all along, right? That's what his purpose was. The pressure of his life spreading outward. Is his life spreading outward? In what sense? That metaphor is a puzzling one to me a little bit, I think. I mean, at least I'm puzzled. The pressure of his life spreading outward like an expanding bubble. Is his life the bubble and the pressure from within him is spreading his life outward? Or his, is his life the pressure being exerted on something else that time is retreating before? I'm not quite sure exactly how, which way I'm supposed to be taking that metaphor. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, let's see. Good. Um, yes, Kay is pointing out, yeah, now the narrator is using ellipses. Exactly, Kay. Isn't that cool? Um, uh, uh, Kay points out how the narrator is is through that through this taking us into the way Paul is drifting away here. Yeah, the the very sort of way in which Paul is gra is sort of groping for ways to understand what's happening to him. Right, we are left doing the same thing. In some ways, I think even my own puzzlement about this metaphor is of a piece with it. Right, Paul himself doesn't understand. Um, uh, Paul himself doesn't understand what's going on exactly, right? Um, Tom suggests that these ellipses show his own terror at this prospect. Um, Tom, I agree. That first one there, again, we're talking about the ones in the last line there. The first ellipsis, I think, really shows, like, he doesn't even want to say what's coming next, right? Outward like an expanding bubble, time retreating before it. Because, whoa. Like, in what sense is time retreating before him, his life, his terrible purpose? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Nancy says, if we're sticking with the disease metaphor, it's, that's, this is kind of disgusting. Um, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, the pressure expanding outwards. I don't, I don't think we're supposed to be imagining a, a mammoth cyst in space time, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> Paul's life as this huge pressure-filled ball of pus expanding outward into time. Uh, you're right, Nancy. That's a horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> image, but I don't think so. Um, I, 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 I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, we, the infection was the initial metaphor, right? Now, I, you know, I, asked, I, I, I was recalling that because, you know, I wanted us to recall that because I do think it's important to remember how he initially understood that, right? The, the, the way in which, it, but he's not been talking about the disease thing here. So I think, I think incorporating the disease metaphor literally and combining it with these metaphors uh, doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be, uh, um, uh, doesn't seem to be opposite. <laughs> Fortunately, because that's awful gross. Um, <laughs> Amber says, well, I am picturing the cyst now. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. Now, um, let's see. Uh, right, Tom Hillman was pointing out that pressure doesn't spread. Uh, grammatically, that's what it says. I, I, I always, I think like the pressure of what pressure? The pressure of his life, of his life being an adjectival phrase, uh, uh, describing pr uh, pressure, the pressure spreading. Okay, so uh, uh, spreading is what the pressure is doing. Grammatically, Tom, I agree, that seems to be what he's saying, and that doesn't really make it, it's a, it's a mixed metaphor, right? Again, it's, it's a, it's not only a, a, a confusing metaphor. It's a confused metaphor in some sense. It's his life spreading outward. A bubble will expand and spread outwards when pressure is exerted within it. But you're right. Pressure itself doesn't spread. Um, yeah, Brian is saying his life is the surface tension of the bubble and the pressure forcing that to expand. That's more Brian. That seems to fit more with what has come before. Remember that empty space, right? He's kind of this empty space with inside him. That idea of him as this, you know, increasingly strained and attenuated bubble that is empty and might just pop, right? Does seem to fit with um, what he's described. But again, notice that's not the force of this metaphor. At least that's not where the metaphor goes at the end. And here again, I come back to that first ellipsis, right? Um, you could also potentially see that first ellipsis is where the concept turns, turns rather. Um, it's not just a bubble getting weaker and weaker and weaker about to pop. It's an expanding bubble and time is retreating before it, right? It's not weak, it's strong. Time itself is retreating away from it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Jessa is just baiting me now, uh, 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 tempting me to, uh, to, 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 to say that Paul is feeling uh, like butter scraped over too much bread. 
But I shan't do it, Jessa. I shan't. I've already said pocket handkerchief, and that's as far as I'll go. Um, uh, anyway, okay. Um, yeah, good. Um, okay. Let's, uh, let's keep going. Paul's going to talk back about the, the uh, Bene Gesserits there. Um, as though he saw inside her mind, it, as if, Paul said, they thought they were reaching for me, but I'm not what they expected, and I've arrived before my time, and they don't know it. Jessica pressed her hands to her mouth. Great mother, he's the Kwisatz Haderach. You think? <clears throat> she felt exposed and naked before him, realizing then that he saw her with eyes from which little could be hidden, and that, she knew, was the basis of her fear. You're thinking I'm the Kwisatz Haderach, he said. It's one of my favorite lines. I, it, it is, I, I, I just love that. He's the Kwisatz Haderach. <laughs> that, 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 that progression. Her italicized thought. He's the Kwisatz Haderach. And then saying, uh, I... Little, little can be hidden from his eyes. I'm exposed and naked before him. You're thinking I'm the Kwisatz Haderach. Yeah, um, okay, yes. He said, put that out of your mind. I'm something unexpected. I must get word out to one of the schools, she thought. The mating index may show what has happened. They won't learn about me until it's too late, he said. Notice at the end, he's just practically having conversations with her thoughts. Right? Like, don't even bother speaking aloud, Mom. It's fine. Like, I'll just talk directly to your brain. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, uh, uh, <laughs> now Alyssa is calling me on uh, uh, using a Tolkien quote here. Uh, it was a coincidence that 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 this subtitle came up right after I said I'm not going to go any further than pocket handkerchief OSA. Totally not intended. Just a coincidence. Um, yeah, yeah. Kay is teasing me for that, too. I can't help it. I'm sorry. Um, Patrick says, somehow I don't think the mating index is going to figure this one out. I agree, Patrick. Isn't that a striking idea? And again, another reminder, at least I take it as another reminder of... You know, we keep kind of thinking of the expanding bubble, too. Like, <clears throat> at the beginning, I was talking about Paul's awareness as being elevated, right? Like, you know, he was, Mentats were operating here, and he was operating way up here, right? But it's not just elevation, right? It's not just altitude. It's more like expansion, right? Expansion outward from the center, being able to encompass uh, more and more. Um, and we see how small is her own thought about this, her own understanding of this. The mating index may show what has happened. Yeah, perhaps the Bene Gesserit, um, you know, genetic records might help me understand what's going on here, right? Um, and Patrick, I agree with you. I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I think they're gonna, I think the Bene Gesserit's probably gonna come up empty um, on this. Um, uh, uh, Gerald Michael asks, "Why does Jessica want to want to want to want to rat Paul out to the Bene Gesserits?" Um, yeah, why does she? Why does she? In part, I think it's her clinging to the. It's like her clinging to the motto. Good. But Kevin Morgan and Sean Hyde at the same moment said she's afraid. Yeah, and like she did before when she went back to the motto, she's like, the mating index, right? I, I think we can see her grasping here. And her grasping at two things. One, wait, I can understand this now. Right, okay, he's... Uh, you know, my son has not just, it's not just, I'm not perceiving that it's not merely that he's left childhood behind, he's morphed into, he, okay, he said he was a freak, and at the time I disagreed, I take it back, he is a freak, right? So, not only that, but now she's, now she's, wait, 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 wait. I've got this, it fits in my grid, he's the Kwisatz Haderach, oh, phew, okay, all right, so my, it's not that my grid was out of whack, or something, or that he's something totally alien, um, it's fine. 
He's the Cuisance Hanarach, the Bene Gesserit grid, comes in again, we're fine. Let me consult the mating index, right? That will be even more comforting. That seems to be um, her reaction here. His response to her thought, then, you're thinking I'm the Cuisance Hanarach, put that out of your mind, is doubly terrifying, I think, right? A, you just fit me into your grid. Don't. If you're fitting me into your grid, you're wrong. That's um, not something, presumably, that she would want to hear. But secondly, um, in saying it like before, I'm going to freak you out by predicting the future, um, and, uh, uh, and I'm going to begin by freaking you out by d telling you both the present, you know, by telling you that I know that you're pregnant, right? Um, you know, that the, the, what he said and the way that he said it sort of shows, presents the proof of the legitimacy of what he's saying, right? Um, so to here, the authority behind the statement, put that out of your mind, I'm something unexpected, is bolstered by his statement, you're thinking I'm the Cuisance Hadarach. Um, I can read your mind right now, Mom. It's not just that I'm the Cuisance Hadarach. Um, I'm something unexpected. And certainly he's behaving in unexpected ways. Remember what the Cuisance Hadarach is, or at least what the Bene Gesserits believe the Cuisance Hadarach to be. He is the male Bene Gesserit, right? The one who can see both ways. Um, the one who can be in many places at once. Um, and what's the... I'm, I'm blanking. Somebody help me. What kind said at the dinner party, do you bring the, uh, uh, the thing which translated... Shortening of the way. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and Sean. Um, the shortening... And Colin. <laughs> yes, several of you. Uh, I know. The, you guys are probably sitting there being like, oh, I didn't type fast enough. Yes, the shortening of the way. Um, the, uh, the, he could be many places at once. The shortening of the way. Um, uh, but um, he says, I'm something unexpected, right? I, I don't fit into your grid, and I can prove it by reading your mind right now. Um, um, to which he responds by saying the mating index may show what has happened. No, 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 really. Surely my grid can apply, right? I'm sure if I look this up, uh, it will make comforting sense of all of this. They won't learn about me until it's too late, he says. Again, continuing unsettlingly to have a conversation with her own, with her mind. If you're not the Cuisance Hadarach, Jessica said, what you couldn't possibly know, he said. You won't believe it until you see it. And he thought, I'm a seed. He suddenly saw how fertile was the ground into which he had fallen, and with this realization, the terrible purpose filled him, creeping through the empty place within, threatening to choke him with grief. He had seen two main branchings along the way ahead. In one, he confronted an evil old baron and said, Hello, grandfather. The thought of that path and what lay along it sickened him. The other path held long patches of gray obscurity except for peaks of violence. He had seen a warrior religion there, a fire spreading across the universe with the Atreides green and black banner waving at the head of fanatic legions, drunk on spice liquor. Gurney Halleck and a few others of his father's men, a pitiful few, were among them, all marked by the hawk symbol from the shrine of his father's skull. I can't go that way, he muttered. That's what the old witches of, our, of your schools really want. I don't understand you, Paul, his mother said. Of course not. He hasn't given any context for his statement at all. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, I see, yes. Tom responding to uh, 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 Paul's comment about how he's not what you expected um, <laughs> uh, is inquiring whether Paul is indeed the Spanish Inquisition. But never mind. Um, uh, both James and Kay, James Stevens and Kay were keying in on the sudden intrusion, the unexpected intrusion of the word grief 
at the end of that paragraph. I found that equally striking just reading it through just now. Let's do that one again. He suddenly saw how fertile was the ground into which he had fallen, and with this realization, the realization of the fertility of the ground into which he, the seed, has fallen, the terrible purpose filled him, creeping through the empty place within, threatening to choke him with grief. Okay, these are all familiar terms, sort of, at least, most of them. Terrible purpose, right? Him being filled with terrible purpose. Um, we had that empty place, right? We refer back to the empty place that he felt within him, um, you know, that sense of emptiness, which was so horrible. And uh, <clears throat> um, the terrible purpose is filling that empty place, or rather, it's creeping through the empty place. That's not the same as filling, actually, come to think of it. There's something in that empty place, but it's almost like that empty place is being exploited by the terrible purpose. The terrible purpose is creeping through it like some kind of sneaky and malevolent creature um, choking him and choking him, or threatening to choke him, with grief. The grief like the grief such as he cannot feel for his father. Um, what is the fertile ground? What is the ground into which he has fallen? I mean. One level of that seems to be easy to understand, right? It seems to be connected with what we've been reading about in the sense that the Missionaria Protectiva has prepared the ground, right? Jessica would have described Arrakis. Did she? Did she use that phrase? I can't remember if she used that metaphor of fertility or sowing, if there's any of that agricultural metaphor, you know, language, if there was any of that earlier, I don't recall. Um, but she was talking about the way being prepared for them by the Missionaria Protectiva and how, I almost said ripe, see, I'm going back to growth metaphors, um, was, you know, Arrakis for exploitation by the Bene Gesserit. Um, so it's easy enough to say, again, he's thinking about the future and he was just saying, we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll live here and, and uh, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to be, we're going to find a place with the Fremen. So with the Fremen, the Fremen are the fertile ground. Arrakis is the fertile ground. Irony, right? Um, but anyway, okay, that's that certainly seems true, but I'm not convinced that that's the only sense in which that metaphor works. Um, uh, is it, um, you know, Kay is thinking of his own parents as fertile ground. Um, in a sense, yeah, certainly in like the Bene Gesserit genetic planning sense, that's certainly true. Um, but um, um, <laughs> sorry, I, I was tempted to say uh, not not quite as fertile ground as Mr. and Mrs. Wiggin, for instance, who can produce nothing but amazing children. Um, but um, but anyway, I think it's I I I, I agree. But um, good Gerald, Michael is asking, is Paul fertile ground for the terrible purpose? Um, yeah, he's seeing himself as falling into fertile ground. Um, so he's not, when, he, when, when the narrator uses that metaphor, he's not describing that, because again, he's, he's talking about Paul being in um, a fertile ground. But, but I'm not sure that the literal meaning of that, that is like on Arrakis or among the Fremen, is the only way to understand that. Um, uh, even thinking, you know, in one sense you can see it back to the um, back to the very first passage we talked about tonight, the last one we talked about last time, um, with his um, with his um, train, you know, thinking about the time bomb, right, and where it started with his training and and uh, uh, and the OC Bible and all those other factors, right, which sort of led to this stuff. You can see his whole upbringing and uh, and everything as 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 fertile ground into which he's fallen. Um, I think there are you know there 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 are several ways in which we can see this uh, um, this happening. And isn't this interesting? Um, 
<clears throat> James is is sort of wondering if the seed is referencing the branchings uh, that he sees in the future. Uh, James, I was just thinking that too. Uh, it, it is a really interesting question, isn't it? Branching seem to be simply used metaphorically to refer to roads, right? He's been talking about the roads of the future. He's been comparing the future to roads and paths, um, you know, from when the Prussian stuff started just a couple pages ago. Um, so branchings makes you think first about road, but then the seed thing transforms that metaphor, right? Uh, the two main branchings along the way ahead now don't just sound like a bifurcation in the road, um, but potentially as two different outgrowths of this organic thing that is growing out of the seed. Um, the branches are choices, Gerald, I agree with that. Um, and I don't think at the end of the day the metaphor really has changed there. I do think branching still refers to road. But we have those other branchings now, the superimposition of the seed metaphor onto that. He's not just standing in the nexus of all of these paths as he saw himself before. Now he sees himself as growing forth. And I, and I, 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 I agree um, with James that the, uh, the, the, the application of, that, of, of the seed metaphor um, to the word branching there, you know, the connection between those two seems very, um, very sort of attractive. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, let's move on because I want to at least get to the end of the. <laughs> I can't very well get to the end of today's class and not have finished what I was going to talk about last time. So, so that just that's 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 no good. He remained silent, thinking like the seed he was. How do seeds think? Um, I mean, I know what foxes think, but I don't know what seeds think. Sorry, okay, I'll stop. I'll stop with the Tolkien references, I promise. He remained silent, thinking like the seed he was, thinking with the race consciousness he had first experienced as terrible purpose. He found that he no longer could hate the Bene Gesserit, or the Emperor, or even the Harkonnens. They were all caught up in the need of their race to renew its scattered inheritance, to cross and mingle and infuse their bloodlines in a great new pooling of genes. And the race knew only one sure way for this, the ancient way, the tried and certain way that rolled over everything in its path, jihad. Surely I cannot choose that way, he thought. But he saw again in his mind's eye the shrine of his father's skull and the violence with the green and black banner waving in its midst. Jessica cleared her throat, worried by his silence. Then the Fremen will give a sanctuary? He looked up, staring across the green-lighted tent at the inbred patrician lines of her face. Yes, he said. That's one of the ways. He nodded. Yes. They'll call me Muad'Dib. The one who points the way. Yes, that's what they'll call me. And he closed his eyes, thinking, Now, my father, I can mourn you. And he felt the tears coursing down his cheeks. Okay. Um, So what's the terrible purpose? Let me come in again. Because that was a foolish question. How does this passage here invite us to view his terrible purpose? It's a more cautious question, more appropriately cautious question. Given how our understanding of things, how Paul's understanding of things is expanding and uh, being transformed over the course of this passage, not just from before to after. It would be foolish indeed to say something like, what is the terrible purpose? Okay, what is the terrible purpose? Jihad, yes, Tom. Um, yes, 
Um, he identifies it with the race, the race consciousness. Thinking with the race consciousness he had first experienced as terrible purpose. So Paul is here saying, yeah, that thing that I used to call terrible purpose, that I used to think of as terrible purpose, now I see what it is. It's the race consciousness. What Erica Smith here calls the animal need to survive. Thinking of humans and animals again, Erica, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Michael Chuskovsky is thinking of this as Darwinian. I'm resistant to that, Michael, primarily because that kind of a higher consciousness is exactly what the Darwinian theory says doesn't happen. Um, and, and I would say it is the great fallacy, this is me speaking, not me paraphrasing Darwin, by the way, um, my own analysis of people who talk about Darwinian stuff. The great tempting fallacy is to talk about natural selection. Um, and anyway, I see this irony in the way that people talk about natural selection. Um, that on the one hand, it, it asserts the, the doctrine of natural selection asserts that there is no mover, there is no cause. Right, um, it is it is just what happens. Um, but people who talk about Darwinianism talk as if a choice is being made, like a species wants to continue itself, like genes want to be passed on and are contriving to be passed on. Um, but that's not again. That is almost antithetical to the actual thing that Darwin was saying. So anyway, that's why I'm resistant to, that, to applying that vocabulary here because I don't think it really fits. Race consciousness is clearly something other, isn't it? Something that is outside, well if not outside the race, outside any of the individuals in the race, is that the sleeper um, that was uh, uh, that was awakened right um, yeah um, Brandon Young is suggesting that uh, the terrible purpose um, that the, the this that move from or that you know that that shift in identification from terrible purpose to race consciousness is a is a is a transcendence. I agree, Brad. At the very least, it's an expansion. Right? Terrible purpose is ultimately egocentric, right? Like he he has a ter a, a purpose, right? His life has a purpose, and it's a terrible purpose. It's scary, right? It's a terrifying purpose, um, or terrible in some other sense. But anyway. But it's his purpose, right? Race consciousness is not just him. Um, he might be the instrument of race con But if there is a race consciousness, it's a thing that's beyond him. It's not just terrible purpose. Um, and I think that there's that sense of expansion. He first experienced it as terrible purpose, but now he is seeing it as race consciousness. But notice, he's not just... Um, He's not just thinking. Um, he's not just thinking of it as race consciousness. He is thinking with the race consciousness he had first experienced as terrible purpose. That's how you think like a seed, apparently. Sharon Powell says race consciousness seems more Jungian. Everyone is caught up in it subconsciously. I totally agree, Sharon. Um, I would go Jung over Darwin there, absolutely. Um, it seems to be much more. Um, and I don't want to get too far into Jung, but um, but I, that, that's very much the direction I was thinking there, too. Um, uh, yeah, more like collective unconscious, uh, again, a Jungian term. Um,
it's not just about his terrible purpose. He's more than the Kwisatz Haderach. He's more than the shortening of the way. Do you bring the shortening of the way, Kind says to Jessica. Um, the way, the Fremen's way, the way to the desire, to achieving the desire of the Fremen. Um, yeah, but it's just as that it's not just his terrible purpose, it's not just the way of the Fremen either. It's bigger than that too. It's bigger than him, it's bigger than the Fremen, it's about the race consciousness. But surely he can't choose that way. He can't choose the way of jihad. He can't choose this violent warfare across the across the you know across the galaxy here. Um with the black and green banner of Atreides flying in the middle of it. Um, notice the Bene Gesserit are themselves the tools. He found he could no longer hate the Bene Gesserit or the Emperor or even the Harkonnens. They were all caught up in the need of their race. They're all pawns. Why are the Bene Gesserit doing their whole breeding thing? Why is the emperor doing his, you know, why is the emperor consolidating power in the way that he is and betraying the Atreides as he has chosen to do? Why are the Harkonnens so awful and doing such awful things in the time and places? But in fact, they're all caught up in the need of the destiny. They were all destined to do these things. The, the machinations of the Bene Gesserit, the duplicity of the emperor, um, the malevolence uh, of the you know and and enmity of the Harkonnens, all of these things have contrived to bring about this circumstance in which Paul the seed gets sown into the desert, which is paradoxically fertile ground, right? On one level of understanding the planting and fertile seed, is that I do think it operates on other levels as well, but at the on the most basic level. Paul is going to be among the Fremen and is going to become Wadib, the one who points the way. Um, and the way leads to Jihad, which is not just his destiny, not just his terrible purpose, but the purpose, the race, what the race consciousness is trying to bring about. Philip says, I hope we go back to this thought at the end of the book. Let's do that. I agree. Um, uh, exactly, James. Um, James Stevens is recalling the passage uh, in the last class, I think it was the last class, when uh, Paul was looking at the Atreides banner and thinking that it could come to re represent many terrible things. Or was that his dad talking about that? But anyway, yeah, exactly. Because that's what we, I think, we, we, oh yeah, it's it's Leto. Joyce was just quoting the same thing. Exactly. Right. Um, exactly. Exactly. Um, so the question, can he choose? He thinks he can choose. He sees multiple paths. Surely I cannot choose that way. Um, notice the irony of that sentence. Surely I cannot choose that way. He has seen, perceived this destiny, the race consciousness, this destiny leading in this direction, and sees how the, 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 the Harkonnens, the Emperor, even the Bene Gesserits, huge multi-generational genetic plant um, themselves have all been tools in the hands of this what racial destiny I don't quite understand the agency of the race consciousness the collective unconscious whatever it is um, it is forming this destiny and they are all its instruments if that's true does he really have a choice is he isn't he too the instrument of this consciousness. So him saying, I'm not going to choose that, right, is ironic already. But he doesn't just say, I won't choose that. He says, I cannot choose that. 
Well, cannot is interesting too, right? It's not, I shouldn't choose that way, or I don't want to choose that way, but I cannot choose that way. Whoa, it kind of sounds like maybe you cannot not choose that way. In fact, do you have any choice whatsoever? So him responding to the perception, which would appear to lead him to the conclusion that he does not have a choice, he says, I cannot comply with that destiny. Surely I cannot choose that way. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tom says, what would Boethius say? Attempting to goad me again. Um, uh, yeah, no, no, not going to do it. Um, okay, Sarah Lagarde was also teasing me earlier about 10 minutes ago saying, is it still too early to talk about Princess Irulan? Uh Yeah, yeah, we're, we're almost there now, Sarah. We're, we're getting close. Um, we're getting close. Why can he mourn his father now? And he closed his eyes thinking. Notice he doesn't just suddenly find himself mourning his father. He thinks, now, my father, I can mourn you. Now? When? Why? Why now? Now when? What defines the now? What happened? What was the turning point? What happened? James says he sees a way out. Somebody earlier, I'm forgetting, who said it, that he's accepting the way, um, that he's chosen a path. Tom, that was you, okay. Um, Joyce says that he's accepted who and what he is. Maybe, maybe. Certainly his nodding and saying yes sounds like he is resolving on a choice, right? But... Here's my impression of this. Before he was standing at the nexus, right? Remember he had that image of him sort of in the middle with seeing the paths going in every direction away from him, right? If you're standing at the nexus of all paths, you're not on any path, right? And only people walking down a path can have human experience in as much as he was outside of time, in as much as he was just sitting there as an expanding pus, but no, it's not, no pus involved, an expanding bubble Right with time fleeing from him, he's not he's not participating in human experience. Right, um, he by nodding and saying yes, that's one of the ways. Yes, they'll call me Wadib, the one who points the way. More ellipses, right? Okay, um, uh, he he's now setting off down a path. Right, he's taking the first steps down one of the roads. Um, and when he does, he recognizes that now, having done so, he can mourn his father. Um, that at least is how I understand that. Um, okay. Um, let's talk about Princess Erewhon. Hey Sarah, want to talk about Princess Erewhon? You still awake? Uh, let's, let's talk about Princess Irohan. Um I, uh, I made a list. I'm not quite as cool as uh, Sparrow Alden, so I didn't make a spreadsheet, but I made a list. And uh, I might have missed one or two. I don't think I did, but I might have. Um, so I apologize if my numbers aren't accurate. These are the sources. Um, I'm trying to uh, assemble a list of the books that uh, Princess Irohan wrote. And so far, in book one, um, this is, uh, this is the, what, what we have of the collected works of Princess Irohan. The Collected Sayings of Muad'Dib, The Manual of Muad'Dib, Muad'Dib Family Commentaries, A Child's History of Muad'Dib, Songs of Muad'Dib, Dictionary of Muad'Dib, Analysis, The Arakeen Crisis, The Humanity of Muad'Dib, and In My Father's House. These are given uh, in, uh, Gerald, uh, uh, Michael says it looks like she had a lot of free time. Yes, uh, the, the, these are, I've, I've arranged these in the order of the number of times they were quoted, 
Uh, the collected sayings of Muad Bib quoted five times as, as by my count, which is more than any other book uh, in the first, though narrowly edging out the manual of Muad Dib and Muad Dib family commentaries. Um, um, and then within, you know, when there's a tie, like the four that are tied for one, I just gave them in the order of their appearance. Um, uh, um, what... The function of the quotations from the copious works of Princess Irulan that we get from the beginning, and I mean the very beginning, right? The opening words of this book are the words of Princess Irulan. Um, it's the frame that the entire story is placed in. You know, we've talked, I've been kind of joking off and on uh, throughout the class so far about how um, the the rampant disregard that this book shows for spoilers, right? Or, to, you know, for protecting against spoilers. Um, how much is revealed and how little is given as a surprise. Um, I think, by the way, um, by my... I would vote that the only thing that has really happened yet, the only reveal that has occurred in the book, um, the only sort of surprising reveal, was the fact that Jessica is the Baron's daughter. That comes in as a... Uh, um, uh, yeah, the Harkonnen an ancestry, as Philip was just pointing in, is the only thing so far. It was hinted at, right? Um, uh, you know, the father who cannot be mentioned said the Reverend Mother, you know, or thought the Reverend Mother at the very beginning. Um, we had hints that there was some portentous secret there. Um, but it's the only thing that's been a secret so far. Uh, however, um, generally that hasn't been the case. But it's more than that, right? It's more than just that we are, you know, uh, Lido, we are told about Leto's death in advance. Um, we have a frame um, which... accomplishes a few different things, right? It serves as a framework in the sense of giving us a future vantage point view of what goes on, right? Um, we have the continual juxtaposition of the adventures of Paul Atreides, you know, and Jessica, and, you know, that is, like, that is the narrative that we get along the way. Um, we don't just get foreshadowing of what is to come we get continual glimpses back at the action which is unfolding before us from a vantage point way into the future. And by looking at the text, by looking at the characters from that point of view, um, it really changes, I think, how we view, um, how we view what's going on in the story, how we view the action of the story. Um, I'm being really um, vague about this. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Brian Yoder is pointing out that if Jessica had had a daughter um, who, had, uh, who had married a son of the Baron, she would have been marrying her own uncle. Um, yes, it's true, and remember that's why we were told explicitly that that's why often um, parentage is not revealed to the kids, because sometimes the Bene Gesserits want to marry them off to, the, to a close relative. Um, exactly. But anyway, okay. Um, Michael Cheskowski is right to say many of the characters also seem to have foreknowledge, right? Particularly Leto, right, with his sort of anticipation, you know, all those death thoughts he's having and everything. Um, yeah, I agree. But um, it gives us, as a reader... A very different point of view. Um, that is to say, we're looking backwards on things. It's one thing to look forward to the future, to have a sense of the future. Um, even a sense of the future like Paul is getting with his kerchief, right? His non-handkerchief. Um, uh, we have a different sense of the future. When we are in those snippets at the beginning of chapters, we are sitting in the future, looking back at the past which is a very different thing than looking towards the future. Um, 
and uh, it does change the narrative tension, as Sarah Lagarde points out. You do know, of course, that Paul Mwadi will survive. Um, it also gives a, a different resonance, right? When Paul says, they will call me Mwadib, um, of course they will. We've been calling him Mwadib, or that is, we've been hearing him referred to as Mwadib from the very, very beginning, from literally page one of the book, right? Um, so again, it has, there's a sense in which we can confirm that Paul knows the future accurately, right? And so it gives us a different vantage point on the story as it happens. It also invites me to ask certain questions about the book. Namely, uh, Princess Irowan wrote all these books. Did Princess Irowan write a book called Dune, maybe? Um, uh, that is to say, what is the status of this book, exactly? Um, the way that we are being given glimpses into this... And, and here I come back... That, what, what I, what I mean by this, you know, the Red Book of Arrakis. Stop it, Philip, stop it. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, go back to the titles for a second. What do you notice? Look at the titles. What kinds of books does Irulan write? It's not only a large quantity of books, it's an impressive, uh, it's, it's, it's an impressive breadth of books, isn't it? What kinds of conclusions can we draw? Um, here's a here's a here's a, a fun game. In fact, it's so much fun I don't want to give it only two minutes. Uh, I'm going to stop now. We'll start with this next time. So I'll leave you with this game to play. Um, think about this for next time. I'll, I'll open next time. I'm going to risk taking a few minutes out of our opening of book two discussion in order to 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 play the Princess Irulan game. Here's how the Princess Irulan game goes. If you've read the future books, forget that you have. Trust me. Um, thinking of only the titles of the books written by Princess Irulan, what conclusions can we come to about Paul? Right About what Muad'Dib's future... Who is Muad'Dib and what's he like? What conclusions can we draw about that? from the title list of her books. What conclusions can we draw about Princess Irulan? Who is she? What's her role? What's her story? We've never met her, right? She's not even been alluded to in the story. Um, who is she? Again, don't tell me if you know. You don't even need, I mean, of course, you only have to read to the end of this book to know. But that's not my question. Forget about that. Looking just at this, what, who is she? What is her role? And what does that suggest to us about Paul in this, about this future world? Um, okay. Think about this. And um, we'll, uh, oh, good. Jess is saying uh, uh, she's never read the book before, so she'll have nothing to forget. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's really, uh, there is a kind of advantage to it. Um, and it's one of the things that I am wanting to do. Um, and I think it's a really valuable exercise. Um, it's just the same thing that I try to do it when I'm, when I'm, re when I'm reading other books. Um, that I think it's a really valuable thing to take an early book on its own terms. Um, it's important to see how later things come to transform it, um, how it comes to fit into the larger world, because the world almost always grows around it. Um, but seeing that progression and watching that unfold is one of the really fascinating things. But you can't do that if you just blur it all together, right? Um, which is why I find it so much more fascinating. We did this... Uh, in the last class when we were reading Tolkien's Book of Lost Tales Part 1, and I kept trying to say, let's think about the Book of Lost Tales on its own, not just kind of merging it in with the Silmarillion stuff and all of Tolkien's other ideas, but what was he thinking here? What was this story like now? So that we can better appreciate what happened and where his thinking went as he went along. And by the way, as a final 
uh, tangential freebie. This is why I loathe the renumbering of the Chronicles of Narnia and refuse to recognize uh, the chronological renumbering, uh, the internal chronology renumbering of the Chronicles of Narnia. It is an absolute abomination, and for exactly this reason. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is the first book in the series. It must be the first book in the series. You can't read The Magician's Nephew as the first book in the series. You can't read it in the way, just said that, you know, I, you're talking about reading Dune here, and that I'm inv how I'm inviting you to see this through the lens of just as it's being given to us here, now, for the first time. What do we see without the future knowledge? We can take, in, take into account the future knowledge, you know, at, at another time, down the road. But what do we know now? What does this text in itself tell us? The Magician's Nephew relies upon the first five books of the series. You can't start there! <sighs> okay, I'm done. Um, I'm teaching my Lewis and Tolkien class for Mythgard right now, which is why I have the Chronicles of Narnia on my... I'm, I'm working towards doing The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. are going to be talking about this stuff and what we see Lewis doing at the beginning of that series. So that's kind of on my back burner as I'm talking about this stuff. But anyway, okay. So... Uh, tangent, uh, uh, tangent over, rant completed. Um, uh, let's, so I'll, I'll talk about this at the beginning of class next time. I did have some good questions that I wanted to get to, and I didn't. I'll, um, I might work them in. Uh, I might even work one or two of them in next time. Uh, I'll see. I'm not gonna. I I I, I shan't. I shan't forget them. I don't want to give you the impression that sending me questions is useless because I'll never get to them anyway. I, I I shan't forget them, and I hope we won't leave them behind entirely. Uh, but uh, anyway, so we'll come back to this and then on to book two next time. Thanks everybody for bearing with me. That was a really fun close reading that we did. I, I've been looking forward to uh, uh, completing our close reading of that passage, which I find one of the most important ones in this entire book. So uh, thanks for all of your help and your wonderful observations tonight. So thanks everybody. Good night. See you next week.